Good morning, church. You guys look good on there. That looks great. Uh, Man, I hope you're having a good morning. I'm excited to open the Word of God with you today, and what a time of worship, even on a little bit of a rainy Sunday morning. Man, what a joy it is to gather together to lift high the name of Jesus, and today is an exciting day. It's an exciting time. we got camp coming up and VBS and all those things, but it's exciting in this moment, too, to gather together. Today, as as you can tell before me, we have the privilege of of uh, celebrating and, and, and having the Lord's Supper. And so I want to give a moment, uh, we're going to do that at the end of our service, but I want to give a moment right now to, to bring some clarity to make sure we're all on the same page of, of who the Lord's Supper is for. And put simply, the Lord's Supper is for the family of God. If you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then today you can partake in the Lord's Supper. It's for a baptized member of an evangelical church so that you're in good standing as a member of that church that preaches the same gospel as this one. So whether you're a member of Edwards Road or of another local church, we invite you to celebrate in communion today. But we're going to do that at the end of our service. We're still in the book of Philippians as we walk through this. And I was reading my Bible this week, and I was in the book of Acts. Y'all have heard of that before, right? We're in the book, I was in the book of Acts. And I, I came back across a verse that I love every time I read that verse. And it's just one that I, I, I love how it's phrased in there. And every time I hear it, it just stands out to me. And it's, a, it, it's in Acts chapter 17. And Paul and Silas, they were in Thessalonica. And they were characterized, that, that they were talked about in a really, really cool way. A way that I would love to be talked about, like Paul and Silas. See, at the end of the verse, as as they're describing Paul and Silas, the people there say this. It says, these men who have come here have turned the world upside down. Isn't that a cool phrase? Like, wouldn't you love to be someone who turns the world upside down? Now, kids, sometimes you turn your house upside down, but that's not what we're talking about. We're, We're talking about Paul and Silas and what they were doing through... Through the gospel, they were turning the world upside down. And man, I would love that to be described of my life and of our church. And you may say, Evan, it's, easy for, it's easier for them to, to have that said about them because Christianity was new, right? Jesus had just left and the resurrection had happened. And so they were bringing in a new way and, and the, the way. And, and so that they were changing things. So of course they turn the world upside down. But for us, that's much harder today. And we can't really do that anymore, Edmund, because we're so far away from the resurrection. Well, I don't think that's true. And I think we're going to see that today. And I, I, I'm going to tell you something to start off our time together that I'm not sure I really have to convince you of this truth. I think you're going to agree with me as soon as I say it. The world we live in is pretty selfish. Would you agree with that? The world we live in is pretty selfish. I mean, people overreact all the time. People think about themselves. In fact, uh, this week we were walking. We love downtown Greenville, and so we were exploring it a little bit in our in our first kind of official week here. And so we're in downtown Greenville, and uh, as we're walking, the, this truck comes out of one of the parking lots, and it kind of cuts this other car off. Like it's it, it's not terrible. There's time to to stop, but like kind of cuts this other car off, and this lady loses it. Right, just. Bah! hits her horn she's banging on her window and like all mad and we're all just kind of watching it and then drives off and I was like well that was kind of dramatic right and if that's you we love you in the name of Jesus Christ today (laughs) Um, but if not let's not be those people right and so that that, there in that moment that driver was just like fueled by rage and anger right because of what had happened and we could cast judgment all we want but act like you've never got frustrated in traffic as well before And so that's from a place of selfishness, right? I wanted one thing, they did something else, and so now I'm frustrated. Every child in the room, or if you have a child, or you were a child, or you've been around a child, you know that children don't like to share toys, right? And that that comes from selfishness. I want it, I want it this way. The, The young couple with children, I hear some babies crying in here. And can I tell you this? I love hearing babies cry. That's great. Don't worry about that. Okay, we need a church where we hear babies crying. And so... Uh, But the young couple who's raising young children who are always in a tired competition, right? I'm more tired. No, you're more, no, I'm more tired. No, I'm more tired. Well, I did this. Well, I did that, right? The the back and forth, and that's fueled by selfishness. I need to win this competition of who is more tired. The coworker who will do anything to get ahead in the workplace. They'll kiss up to the boss. They'll cut corners. or They'll do whatever it takes to, to make it ahead. Like we live in a selfish world. Family members who look out for their own interests and not for the interests of the whole family. Like, selfishness is in our world. So I think, 
I would argue with you today, I would show you in Scripture today, that I think today, in the time that we live in, if, it wants to, if we want to be said of us that we turned the world upside down, we can do that in a world full with self, filled with selfishness. And Paul gives us the answer on how we can turn the world upside down in the culture we live in today. We're going to see it in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1-4, through 4, is what we're going to look at. And I have to warn you, before we read it, I have to warn you, Today may not be an easy day, and I say that because as I studied this text this week, it sat on me hard. This text is one that you'll read it and we'll all agree with, but if we allow the Holy Spirit to do His work today in our lives, I think some things will be revealed to us that we need to hear today, because Philippians 2 goes right after our heart. Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 4 are about pride. And how easily we are filled with pride. And so last week, we looked at the end of chapter 1. But remember, this is one letter. So don't separate it out from last week because we took a week's break or because of the chapter break. This portion of the letter, it it really goes together. Paul's speaking a unified message here. And uh, what our idea today is, as he continues this idea, the main idea of our sermon, if you're taking notes, you can write this, is true unity is found through humility. True unity is found through humility. We talked about unity last week and standing firm and all of that. Well, he's going to continue to say, if we want to be unified as a church, as a family of God, then we have to do that through humility. The the unity is still the theme. He's carrying it on in this moment. And last week, in the end of chapter 1, it was about having unity against outside pressure, outside opponents, standing firm in that. But now he's going to direct it to unity within the body of Christ. And that's where we are, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Let's stand in the honor of the reading of God's word as we read these verses together. It says, If then there's any encouragement in Christ... If any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God, we love you. And God, in this moment, as we open your word, God, would your spirit begin to work in our lives to reveal our hearts, to reveal our motives, our intent. God, not just affirming a verse because it sounds good, but Spirit, would you do your work in us? God, would we live lives of humility that Jesus has called us to, that Jesus himself modeled for us? And God, as we talk about this idea of turning the world upside down. God, if we are a humble people that serve others, we will stand out in the culture, the selfish culture around us. And so God, today, would you transform us? I pray that we would look more like Jesus when we walk out of this room than when we walked into it. In your name we pray. Amen. You guys can have a seat. So in chapter 1, we're doing a little bit of a recap here. In chapter 1, Paul showed us that we could have joy no matter our circumstances, right? Say joy. joy. That we can have joy no matter our circumstances. And, and you would agree, we've already talked about this, that, that circumstances, they can rob your joy if you let them. Difficult moments and situations in life can rob our joy, but they don't have to. And Paul gave us the answer. And how did he show us that we don't have to lose our joy in the midst of difficult situations? Well, I told you it's by having a single mind, right? Being single-minded on the advancement of the gospel, growing in maturity, living a gospel-worthy life. That's how we don't allow joy to be robbed from us in circumstances, is to have a single mind. And that's so valuable to us. But I also want you to know circumstances are not the only thing that can rob our joy. You know what else can rob our joy? People, right? Right? People can easily rob our joy. I don't have to convince you of that. Someone can say one thing to you, do one thing at you, and your joy is gone, and your day is ruined, and you are frustrated and in a bad mood the rest of the day. I've heard there's an old saying in ministry. I'm not saying I agree with it, but there's an old saying in ministry that says, ministry would be great if it weren't for people, right? 
Um, and that's not true. Ministry is people. It is serving and caring for people. But I understand the heart of the people can be hard. That's true in ministry, but that's true in whatever role you play, whether a mother or whether a businessman or a teacher or whatever you are. People can be hard. They can rob our joy so easily. You can wake up saying, today's going to be a good day. I'm going to have joy today. And then one person do something and you lose it. And so how can we continue to have our joy in spite of people? We learn to have joy in spite of circumstances is to have a single mind, but to have joy in spite of people is to have a submissive mind, is what Paul would argue here. We have to have a single mind for our circumstances and a submissive mind when dealing with people. You see, a submissive mind is a mind that forgets about self and focuses on Jesus, serving Jesus, and serving other people. And when we do that, did you know when we do that, focus on Jesus and serve other people, results in joy in our life. So he starts by reminding them of their reality and then calling them to live out that reality. That's what we see as we start in verses 1 and 2 here. Our first point, we only got two today. I'm going to throw you off a little bit, not three. We got two today. The first one is this, the cause of our unity. The cause of our unity. Say cause. The cause of our unity. We see this in verses 1 and 2, particularly 1 right here. Now, when I was 17 years old and I was graduating from high school, I know we just had some graduates as well, I I received gifts from people, right? They would send me cards and gifts and and money, and I enjoyed the money a whole lot, right? I enjoyed it, and those were gifts people took time to send to me. And so my mom, being a very loving and caring mother, she said, hey, Evan, you need to write thank you cards to everyone who sent you a gift. And teenage Evan's a little bit different than Evan today, and uh, teenage Evan... There's a few things going on there. Teenage Evan didn't like being told what to do, okay? If you have a teenager in your house, you may relate with that a little bit. If you are a teenager, you know what I'm talking about. Teenage Evan didn't like being told what to do. In fact, sometimes I would know stuff was right, but if my parents told me to do it, I didn't want to do it anymore. I was going to do it, but because they told me to do it, now I don't want to do it because I didn't like being told what to do. By the grace of God through sanctification, hopefully I'm growing in that area. And so I didn't like being told what to do, but also I didn't like writing thank you notes, Like, I didn't like taking time to sit down and and write each and every one of those out. So my mom said, Evan, you need to send thank you notes to everyone who sent you a gift. So you know what 17-year-old Evan did? 17-year-old Evan went on Microsoft Word and typed up a generic thank you, about a paragraph long. I printed off a bunch of copies. I cut it with scissors, not even a straight edge, right? The scissors, so it was all like jagged and stuff. And then I taped it inside of thank you cards, and I sent it out to the people who gave me a gift. I'm sure they really appreciated that. My heartfelt thanks back to them. You see, not only did I not like being told what to do, but I didn't understand fully the heart behind what my mom was trying to tell me to do. You see, she wasn't just giving me a command because that's a ritual and we're supposed to do it. She was giving me that because it was for my good. Because these people took time to sacrifice and give on my behalf, and so I should express my thankfulness back to them. I needed to understand the heart behind it, and I didn't at the time. What I love about these verses here is before Paul tells us what we need to do, he tells us why we need to do it. He, he, he gives the cause for our unity. He reminds them of their reality of who they are in Christ before he tells them what to do. Look back at verse 1. If then... There is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with spirit, if any affection and mercy. I love how he starts this off because it sets the stage for the rest of it. He even, the, the if there at the beginning pulls back to what he just said a moment ago. If you think back to last week, I know that was a long time ago. We had some beautiful weather this week. But if you can go back to last Sunday, right, and get there with me, we started off with just one thing, as citizens of heaven live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Live a gospel-worthy life, right? So he was there, and so now he's pulling this if to go back to what he just wrote. And he's saying, look, you you are a citizen of heaven. You, You are a follower of Jesus. And you're called to stand firm and stand together, stand united. And since you are in Christ, since you are a citizen of heaven, there's some realities that are true for you, some truths that are true for your life. And so he's pulling that over These are your your realities because you are in Christ. And each of these phrases, he says here, starts with if any. Now, when we say if, a lot of times we're giving kind of choices of one thing may happen or another thing may happen. That's not what the language communicates here at all. 
You see, this if any is a conditional clause that assumes what follows it is true. That assumes what follows it is a reality. These if statements could be better understood if it helps your mind to say since or because, right? The, The if refers to a certainty, not a possibility. And so what are the certainties for those who are found in Christ? The first one we see there, it says, since then there is encouragement in Christ. If you're in Christ, you have encouragement in Christ. This carries the meaning of someone standing alongside of you. I want you to reflect today about the joy and the encouragement it brings into our life to realize and to know that Jesus is standing alongside of you. That you don't walk this life alone, but if you are in Christ, you have Christ with you. You have a spirit living within you, and so since... If you're in Christ, since there's encouragement in Christ. The next one is since there's consolation of love. This idea of consolation, it's the act of bringing comfort to someone. I love a definition that I saw this week said, it's something that makes someone sad or disappointed feel better, right? This consolation of love, something that makes someone sad or disappointed feel better. Does knowing Jesus bring comfort into your life? Does knowing Jesus bring a comfort that you can't get over into your life? I sure hope it does. Listen, my prayer for us today, and it's so easy to happen to us, is that we we begin to get this mindset of like, oh man, I'm so good, right? Like, I I can barely even name any sin I've done this week. right? God is so lucky to be able to use my gifts and my talents for His kingdom, right? Like, like, God, I know it's hard for you to love some other people, but God, it's really easy to love me, right? I'm, I'm pretty good. And it's so easy for us to begin to fall into that mindset, but that should never be our hearts when following Jesus. It should blow our minds that the God of the universe, the perfect God, that He loves you. It should blow our minds that He wants a relationship with you, and for some reason, He wants to use you to advance the gospel, like, that, that should blow our minds and bring great comfort to us. Like listen, th- this truth, that even though I don't deserve it, He loves me anyway, and He wants to use me, that should propel us forward on mission, to live out the hope and the truth of the gospel. And it puts us in that submissive mindset. It puts us in a place of looking to surrender our lives to serve other people. That's not about us. Because who am I to be loved by God? Who am I to receive salvation? And so it puts me in a place of looking around me to say, how can I serve other people? We do it not because of how good we are, but because He first loved us. Because of what we've been given, we give it out to other people. Would you hear me today? Who are we to think so highly of ourselves that other people become a nuisance to us when the God of the universe chose to love you and save you. Like when people, we allow them to to just be a nuisance in our way, to rob our joy. Like when I understand what God has done for me, man, I want to show grace and love and encouragement to the people around me. That propels me forward to live on mission, to go into my neighborhood and invite people to Vacation Bible School. to to walk over to the new neighbor and introduce yourself and to begin to share your hope and encouragement with them, to meet a need in their life, in your workplace, to pray for your coworker. That propels us forward on mission. But listen, that all sounds good, but we're prone to pride. We're prone to selfishness. We're prone to only think about ourselves and depend upon ourselves. I know I am. I'm prone to depend on my gifting. I'm prone to depend on what I can do myself. And that is why, church, we have to remind ourselves of the gospel every single day. The gospel is not just for the moment we surrendered our life to Christ. We need the gospel every single day. We need to preach it to ourselves. A statement that I like to use is we have to preach to ourselves instead of listening to ourselves. You see, our mind and our hearts will tell us lots of things. Our mind may fill our our bodies and our minds with anxiety and worry. Our heart may fill with pride and selfishness. And so daily, I remind myself, I preach to myself the truth of the gospel, that God saved me. And so that propels me out to be submissive and to love other people. He continues on with two more certainties of those who are found in Christ. The third one is, since there is fellowship with the Spirit. 
Look beside you. Look at the people on either side of you really quick. Look beside you. Most of the people in here, that is, there, there's no one there, Keith. You're looking at a blank seat. I'm sorry. Um, but the people around you, this is your family in Christ. For those who have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, say, you have fellowship in the Spirit with them. And that's what this speaks of, is the family that we have through the Holy Spirit. And what an encouragement it is to have this. Paul here uses the same word he used back in chapter 1, verse 5. You may remember it. Always praying with joy for all of you in my every prayer because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. This idea of partnership, working together, that we, we're not a church, we're not a family just because we gather in the same place on Sunday mornings, but because of the Spirit that binds us together and having a unified mission. And so Paul is aware that, that, that this unity is threatening this Philippian congregation. So he reminds them of the Spirit-produced fellowship that they have with one another. And so there's encouragement in Christ. Since you have consolation of love, since you have fellowship in the Spirit, and the fourth one is since there is affection and mercy. This is given to us by Jesus. He has shown us affection and mercy. You see, Christ has loved you with an amazing tenderness. He has shown you infinite affection. And this should cause us to look out for the interests of others. And so then, so Paul is saying, so since you have these things in Christ, this is your cause here, that because you have these things in Christ, now he's going to say, do these things. Because this is your rea reality, because you are in Christ, now do this. He gave the reason, now he's giving the command as we continue to walk through this text. And let me give you a side note right here that I think is helpful that I was reminded of this week. This is the same thing we need to do for unbelievers, okay? So often what we want to do as Christians is we want to give the command without giving the heart behind the command. We, 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 before we tell them what, what exactly it is that they're doing wrong, though sin needs to be confronted, we have to introduce them to the love of Jesus Christ. Because the love of Jesus, the gospel, is the hope that, that they are incapable on their own, unbelievers, of saving themselves from their sin. Yes, that, that there is a reality that they need to know they are lost and separated from God, but God, there is love and grace and hope found in him. And so just as Paul is saying, okay, here's your reality, and now here's what you do. Would that be a reminder to us as we love people, that we introduce them to the love of Jesus Christ, which does the transforming work in our lives. And so he wants to show them not only, here's who you are, but now here's what you do. And that's our second point as we continue to walk through this. Our second point is this, the gospel uh, the, the call to unity. I'm sorry, the call to unity. So we saw that the gospel is the cause of our unity, and now we have the call to humility. I'm sorry, the call to humility. You see, the only way that we can experience true unity is through humility that we see here, and that's what Paul is showing the church in Philippi, and he's showing us today. As we continue to walk through this text, Paul gives three calls or commands in this text that is true for them and it's true for us. So, hey, this is your reality in Christ. Now, here's what you are to do with that reality. These are the three things. This is what you need to do to turn the world upside down, as we said earlier. The first command he gives them is this, make my joy complete. Make my joy complete is what we see there. Paul wanted the, the church there to have a unity and a like-mindedness that would bring him joy. And you may say, Evan, you're talking a lot about selflessness and humility, but you say Paul's first command is make my joy complete. He's pointing a finger at himself and saying, here's what I want you to do to make me happy, to bring me joy. Isn't that kind of selfish of Paul? Well, what Paul's doing here reminds me of 3 John verse 4. It says, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the truth, right? And so Paul here, as a spiritual father, his joy is tied to the unity and the selflessness and the humility of this church because he loves them. If you're a parent in the room, you get this. You understand there's nothing that brings that, that, that is better for a parent's well-being than to, to see their children walking in maturity and wisdom and growth, Right? As you see them making wise decisions, as you see them walking in matur maturity, it brings such joy to your life. It completes your joy, right? It, 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 it's for their flourishing, it's for your good, and you like to see it. And so Paul here, as their father, is saying he's longing for them to be unified, to walk in humility. And so make my joy complete. How can they make his joy complete? He says it. 
by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. That's how they can make his joy complete. Let's put it simply. Thinking the same way, that's their mind, right? Having the same love, that's their heart. United in spirit, that's their spirit. Intent on one purpose, that's their mission. So that, that they would have the same mind, the same heart, the same spirit, the same mission. This gives them one purpose. It's not just a superficial unity. It, it, it is who they are at their core. It's their heart, their mind, their spirit. They are tied in this together. Instead of having petty squabbles or disagreements within the body, we must get our heads on straight and remember our identity and our common purpose. Church, that's who we have to be. If we want to be together for the gospel, then we can't allow petty disagreements to get in our way as we move forward. We have to have the same mind, the same heart, the same spirit, the same purpose to walk forward in unity together. So that's his first call. Make my joy complete by, by thinking the same way, having the same affection, doing the same things, walking and marching in the same direction. That's how you make my joy complete. The second thing, the next call he gives them here is the next verse. And man, this verse, man, if it's not underlined in your Bible, if you don't have this on your phone, like whatever you need to do, don't forget this verse. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. That sounds really good on a coffee mug, doesn't it? But man, that is a hard verse to live out. It's so difficult. I would argue that there is nothing our heart bends towards more than pride. Our, our heart naturally flows into this. And that's why the Bible spends so much time condemning pride because we so naturally fall into it. Hear this today that pride is the greatest roadblock to both our unity as a church and your joy as a disciple of Jesus. Pride is the greatest obstacle you and I will have to overcome to have unity as a church and to have joy as a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. And listen, we must put pride to death. We have to kill it. We can't allow it to live in our lives. We have to put it to death. That's what he's telling them here. He gives them a negative command first, right? Like, like we have to take off, do nothing out of selfish ambition and conceit. We have to take off our selfish ambition and we have to put on humility. Take off what our heart wants to do and put on the humility that comes through the Spirit and through Jesus Christ. Let me give you an important thought today. As we look at Scripture, I want you to think about why did Satan fall from heaven? Why did Satan fall from heaven? Well, Satan fell from heaven because of pride, Right? Satan wanted to, to, he desired to be like God, to receive worship from God. On the other side of that, we look at Jesus. And Jesus already had pride and glory and worship bestowed upon him. And yet Jesus, we'll see this in the next passage that we look at in Philippians. Jesus, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, putting on humility to the point of dying on a cross, dying our death. And so what I would argue that when we are operating out of pride, we're never more like Satan. And I would argue that when we are operating in humility, we're never more like Jesus. And as I pray for us and for myself, that we would look more like Jesus when we walk in this room than when we walked out of it, walk out of it. This is what it looks like that we would lay pride down on the altar and we would live in humility. You see, for our church, for us, for, for us to have true unity, we have to have Christ-like humility. For us to have one purpose and one mission, to have true unity, it's our main idea, we have to operate in Christ-like humility. Rivalry and pride it will divide our church in a terrible way as we move forward. And it's so easy for us as individuals to allow selfish ambition and conceit to rule our lives, right? I want the credit. Look at me. I, I, I want credit for this. 
I like, I want the right idea all the time. I want the glory. When something happens, I want the glory. Look at me. Give me appreciation. Give me applause, right? We want to be seen as better than someone else. We want our idea to be the best idea. We want to be the one who gets the recognition for the thing. I, I, I. And we begin to turn inwards, and this selfish ambition is saying, I want the glory. And we don't even realize we're doing it, guys. Like, it's so easily our heart just drifts there, and we're doing things that look like we're doing them for Jesus. But if we really evaluate, we want the glory for them. We, we want people to say, man, look at how good that person is. We want the approval of others around us, and we have to kill that within us and be single-minded about the advancement of the gospel, be submissive-minded about the good of other people. This word conceit that Paul uses here, right here, it carries with it the idea of empty glory, like glory that doesn't matter at all. And so when we make decisions about ourselves, when we want the glory for ourselves, it doesn't matter at all is what Paul is saying there's no significance it makes no difference but when we live a life that the aim is to bring glory and honor to Jesus now that is a life that matters and that will turn the world upside down you see we should see the glory of Jesus instead of our own glory and rejoice whenever God is using someone else even other than ourselves to advance the gospel if the ministry in our church that we're passionate about Like, we praise God if that is the one that we see people growing and coming to know Jesus. But if one over here that we're now a part of takes off, then praise God for it. If God is using someone other than ourselves to advance the gospel, praise God for it. Because it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about the gospel, it's all about Jesus. And none of us like to think we're driven by selfish ambition. None of us. If I walked around today and asked you, you would probably say no. I would have probably said no as well. None of us think we operate in conceit or empty glory. But let me ask you some questions as we begin to evaluate our own hearts in this moment. Am I driven by the approval of other people? Am I making decisions based off the approval of other people? That's one way we're we're working for our own glory because we want people to be satisfied and happy with us, right? And so is that driving my decision making? Let me ask another question to ourselves. Do I often celebrate the success of others? Do I want people to just like shower encouragement on me for what I'm doing? Or am I a person that celebrates the success of other people? The last one uh, I would ask that we evaluate. Do I think of the needs of others often or only my own needs? That's where Paul is heading here. How we answer these questions shows us what we're putting on and what we're taking off. And my fear today is that some of us have put on pride. We don't even realize that we've been doing it. You see, we'll never have unity if we don't walk in humility. Paul gives one more call here. He gives one more call. It's really a fleshing out of what he just said in verse 4. It says, everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. I love this progression from Paul. When I have a lowliness of mind, I will have a helpfulness of heart, right? When I have a lowliness of mind, I will have a helpfulness in my heart. A life like Jesus is a life of caring for others. That's why this is not all there is in the Christian life. The gathering of the body is so important. We should not neglect it. But then we go out. We gather and then we scatter. Because we are called to care for those around us. And we're called to care for those who are within our body as well. You see, I don't have to remind you today to care for your own interests. You're all going to eat after church today, I guarantee you, right? You're going to find a place to eat. But man, it's so easy to only think about our own interests, our own concerns. It feels natural. But a life of humility is marked by genuinely genuinely caring for the needs of other people. And not only their material needs. I think in this moment when I talk about the needs of other people, it's easy for us to go to their material needs. And we should be meeting those. And I have to say, as I was prepping this week, I would say church, in large part, it it seems like this is a church that we do a really good job of that, right? Caring for the needs, physical needs of other people. But there's more to this than just caring for physical needs. There's other needs we need to care for. Let me ask you this question. 
when something, someone's talking to you and telling you about their life, do you genuinely listen to them? But that's caring about the interests of others over yourselves. And so do you stop what's going on in your mind and ask God to give you the focus to, to hear what's going on in their life? And do you not just say in polite southern hospitality, I'll pray for you, but do you actually pray for them? And do you follow up with them and say, how's it going? How can I help you? How can I support you in that? You see, this is what it looks like as a church body for us to care for the needs of one another, to care about the interests of each other. So we should be ready not only to say, yes, we'll pray for someone, but to help them and actually help them, to keep our eyes open, to bear one another's burdens, because that is how we bring unity in this body, is through humility. You see, when my eyes are focused only on me and my problems and my concerns and my issues, it creates disunity within the body. It's the opposite is true. When you're only caring about yourself and I'm caring about myself, the opposite is produced, and it's disunity, it's rivalry, it's pride. And so we have to begin to be people. We have to continue to be people who care about the interests of others more than ourselves because true unity is found through humility. So do you want to turn the world upside down? I do. I I, I want to turn the world upside down for Jesus so badly. So how do we do it? Well, we do it by operating in Christ-like humility instead of pride. In a selfish world, in a world that only looks out for itself, that only thinks for itself. If we are to be people who live in humility, who think of others as more important than ourselves, who care for the needs of others, that is going to stand out in a lost world. That's going to stand out in this world and it is going to turn the world upside down. You can invite someone to church and you should be inviting people to church, but if you cared for their needs, they're a lot more likely to be sitting next to you in this church today. If you listen to their problems and care for them and pray for them, They know that you actually love them. And then they want to become part of your church family. See, it's easy for us just to say, hey, you should come and be a part of it. But to live like Christ is to take time to listen to them and care for them and be there for them. Because that is the humble life. And within this body, if we want to have true unity, we should live, we have to live in humility to care for someone else. So today, how can we grow in humility? I want to end this on a really practical note. If we're to take off pride and put on humility, how can we grow in humility today? I've got four really easy things for you. Well, they sound easy, but they can be difficult to do in practice. Four ways that we can grow in humility. The first one is to serve others. To serve others. Using our hands. Look for ways this week that you can serve someone else. You could start right after the service by taking some of these chairs down, right? But look for ways to serve others. Like every morning, think about what it would change as you go throughout your week. If when you wake up in the morning, you say, God, would you show me someone that I can serve today? And you begin to serve others. That's how you put on humility. The second way that you grow in humility is to meditate on God's word. Meditate on God's word. You see, serving is your hands, but meditating is your mind. It's reflecting on the truth of God and then will do His transformational work in us. So many people recommend quiet times or Bible reading times in the morning. You know why? Because it begins to focus us not only on our own needs, but the needs of others to be looking out. And so would you meditate on the Word of God? The third way you can grow in humility this week is to pray. Prayer shapes our heart. It, it, it begins to mold us and turn us into who God wants us to be. So spend time in prayer each day, and you'll begin to grow in humility. And the fourth way that you grow in humility is to reflect on the cross of Jesus Christ. Each and every day, would we reflect on the cross of Jesus, the ultimate sign of humility. The Son of God humbled himself to the form of a servant to die on the cross. And so who am I to think more highly of myself when he walked in humility. It's the ex- ultimate example of humility. And that's one of the purposes of the Lord's Supper. As we come in this moment to begin to get ready to take the Lord's Supper, it's to set our heart and our minds and our gaze and our affection on Jesus Christ. To remember the humility and the sacrifice that He showed. But also, I want to remind you, as we talk about living in unity through humility, as we come to the Lord's table in this moment, 
we remember that we're coming in this moment to eat together as a family of God. Listen, this is a family meal, right? This is a family meal. It's not just a, that there, there is an individual aspect to the Lord's Supper. As you reflect in your heart, as you ask the Lord to reveal sin to you, as you, ref, as you gaze upon Jesus on the cross, like as we remember that, but there is a collective nature to the Lord's Supper as well. Sharing a meal together as a family, declaring Jesus till he comes again. You know, as Paul says, we all eat of one bread and therefore we are one body. And as we talk about this idea of unity today, I want you to hear me really clearly as we're about to step into this Lord's Supper moment. I want you to examine, is there anything in your life that's hindering the body of Christ? Not just reflecting on your own personal relationship, but as we talk about unity within the body and having humility with each other, Scripture tells us that we can step into this moment in an unworthy manner. He tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself in this way. Let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So as we step into this moment, I, I ask that you would examine do you have conflict with another member of the body of Christ? Is there something unsettled between you and someone else in this room or someone who's not here today? You, so, you see, we need to examine our hearts because we don't want to take this in an unworthy manner. As we step into the family meal to reflect and gaze upon Jesus, would we do that in a manner that's worthy that we're called to? You see, here in a moment, uh, Keith Brown, the, the deacons are going to stand and we're going to get ready to take this. And, and Keith, he's going to come and pray as we get ready to take the bread. And I just want to instruct you before we get to that moment. This moment may feel, in worship service, usually we go right from one thing to the next thing to the next thing. And this moment may feel maybe a little longer to you than it normally does. And I want to say, let's use this time to reflect on the cross, to ask God to to let us lay down our pride, to put on humility, but also to pray for unity within the body of Christ. Listen, I know we don't have children's church today, so there's kids in the room. Reminder from the beginning, this is a moment for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so parents, this is an excellent time if your kid has questions to explain to them why we're doing what we're doing. I would encourage you as we reflect and as the piano is being played, as we reflect on Jesus Christ on the cross, that maybe, dads, you would gather your family up right where you're sitting and you would pray over them in this moment. That we would reflect as a family of God in this moment on what it means to have unity and humility and ultimately what it means for Jesus to go to the cross on our behalf.